Sí, hey. Check. Hey, hey. I don't like his test for one, too. Hello everyone, good morning. Welcome to day one of The Seed. Our first panelist, Dr. Will Tuttle, educator, composer, pianist, writer, author of The World Peace Diet, which is number one, the number one Amazon best-selling book, peace activist and vegan for over 30 years, recipient of the Courage of Conscience Award, PhD from UC Berkeley, focusing on education, intuition, and altruism. Creator of the World Peace Diet Mastery and Facilitator Training Programs. He has taught college courses in philosophy, humanities, mythology, and comparative religion. Former Zen monk and Dharma master in the Korean Zen tradition. Co-founder of the Worldwide Prayer Circle for Animals currently conducting a music, art, and education ministry with a spouse, Madeline, a visionary artist from Switzerland. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Will Tuttle. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, well, this is it. We're starting off the seed experience. Let's give a big hand to Paz and everyone who helped make this event possible. I'm really grateful for this. Wonderful to be here with you this morning. <clears throat> and so, how many of you actually, sister, I have a feeling for it, have actually read The World Peace Diet? So you have a, an idea. Quite, oh, good. Wow. About a, a third or half of the people. So what I'd like to do, um, you know, we'll, have a little, we'll have some time uh, at the end for questions. Um, but, you know, this is really uh, an opportunity, basically. The time kind of flies by. Uh, and uh, I have about an hour to talk to you about the World Peace Diet and, and take some questions, some of the main ideas to understand the deep structure, not only of our society, but of how powerful and how important veganism is. Um, can you hear me okay? Is it working? Okay, good. So before I start, though, actually, uh, I'll just see, does anyone have any pressing question? I can maybe take one, um, one, one a question at the very beginning about thriving as a vegan or being an effective vegan advocate or if you have any questions at the beginning, otherwise I'm going to dive in to the talk. So does anyone have a, a question at the very beginning? Probably not. It's too early for any questions in the morning. <laughs> Great. That's fine. So, um, okay, we one guy in the... Yeah, go ahead. You have a... I don't know if I can hear you, but...
You just want to know if there was one, I couldn't quite, what would it be? What was it? Say, maybe come a little closer and say, I just couldn't quite get it, unless somebody else wants to repeat it. But. Okay. Right, right, right. Okay, the question is, what would be sort of the single most persuasive um, argument or thought to help someone uh, move toward uh, veganism, a, a, a plant-based diet for ethical reasons? And um, I think actually the, there's a missing piece very often in vegan advocacy, which I'm going to be talking about here right now. Um, I think the, the most powerful message we can give people who are uh, pre-vegans, right? They're not vegans yet, but they will be. <laughs> Sooner or later, I think we're all going to go vegan in this life or the next. But, you know, the basic idea is that people who are not vegan, people who are still eating, you know, taking out their wallets, paying for meat, dairy products, and eggs, and so forth, are only doing it for one reason. They're doing it because they are following orders. They're doing it because they're just doing what they were told to do by their parents and by their teachers and the educational, religious, governmental, corporate system injects all of us with a mentality and with behavior from the time we're little infants to think that we need to eat meat, dairy products, and eggs to be healthy and that it's natural and, and that whole thing. So the most powerful thing to tell people, I think, really, is to explain that, we've dis that I, as a vegan, have discovered that the only reason I'm eating meat, dairy products, and eggs is because I've been told to do it. I'm just following orders. I'm not thinking for myself. I'm just being basically robotic behavior that I'm just going along, doing what I've been told, not thinking, not looking up. And it's not in my best interest. It's very terrible, really, for health, for the environment, for animals, for future generations, for wildlife. And to help people see that it's simply, they're just it's simply a behavior that they're engaging in because of their community, and it's obsolete. And I think once people understand that, it's not like there's anything wrong with them. Or it's just that we, we're all raised in a society that forces us from the time we're little infants to disconnect from our natural wisdom and compassion. And that this is really uh, something that we can all question. And when we do, so I think it's really important when we talk to people to, to uh, agree with them. If they say something that we don't think is right, it's kind of stupid, or they say, well, you know, plants have feelings too, you know, so whatever, you know, all these different arguments people use. But to say, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I, you know, I, I used to think the same thing, but then I discovered. So use I statements. I discovered that eating animal-based foods is not only devastating to our environment. I think talking about that is very important today because it really is. Uh, and, and, to, and, and to animals and to wildlife and to hungry people, but also, when I moved to a plant-based diet and, and uh, became a vegan, I just, you know, I feel better. I feel better. I have, my health is better. I feel better about myself. And talk about our own personal experience. That's the most powerful way, I think, to actually plant seeds effectively. Um, because as, as we are thriving as vegans and, and feel the, um, the benevolence of, uh, of our actions and, and get in touch, I think, at a deeper level, but the fact that we live on a beautiful and abundant planet that can feed everyone, really on a fraction of the land, with a fraction of the resources, if we would move to a plant-based diet. And then we begin to realize that we're just, we're born into a, a culture with a very obsolete, ridiculous, foolish uh, food system that does work very well to concentrate a lot of wealth in the hands of a tiny, wealthy elite. But for us, the people, it's terrible. I mean, it's bad for the earth, bad for our health, bad for animals. Uh, it, on every level, it causes war and so forth. So what I'd like to do, thanks for that question. That's a good introduction into the whole thing. And um, the basic idea here I'd like to share with you is that all of us have been born into a society th that has a taboo, a fundamental taboo. We're not supposed to talk about or even think about the ramifications of our food choices. You know, what happens when I take out my wallet and I pay for meat, dairy products, or eggs, what does that cause? We're not supposed to think about that. We're supposed to stay very shallow and just think, well, it just come, you know, like the, the burger, the, I think it was McDonald's advertisements used to say that burgers come from a burger patch, right? You just kind of pluck them off a tree, you know, it's like an apple or a strawberry or something. And uh, so, but actually it has massive ramifications. So the basic message really I'd like to share with you in the brief time that I have actually here is that there's no greater adventure we can go on 
society, adventure of empowerment, of awakening, of living a life of meaning and purpose and of authenticity and to actually unfold the unique uh, potential that we have to make the world a better place than to take the adventure of looking behind the curtain of our culture's food choices. Now, I think if you found your way into the seed experience, you're probably somewhat on the path already. How many of you have looked behind the curtain a little bit? Some of you, yeah, okay, some of you. Some of you, how, how many of you don't want to do that because it's pretty scary <laughs> kind of thing? Oh, good. How many of you never raise your hand no matter what? <laughs> anyway, you know, this is the thing. We, we, we really are, are discouraged so strongly in our society from, from looking behind the curtain, right? Remember in The Wizard of Oz, little Toto pulled the curtain back? That's what we need. We need to have a Toto to pull the curtain back and see what's going on because the food system in our society is devastating on every level. And in the World Peace Diet, the main thing we talk about really is not only the outer devastation to the planet and to our culture and to our health, but the inner destruction to the inner landscape of our feelings, our thoughts, our emotions, our psychological health, our spiritual health. This is where it really is important to understand. So what I'd like to do uh, is just talk briefly about the outer and then go into the inner uh, manifestations of our food system. And, and, and basically, the underlying idea to understand here at the very beginning is that anthropologists understand that food rituals, in other words, every society has food rituals. They're called meals, the daily meals that we're eating. They are the most powerful rituals in any society in terms of connecting us to the cultural um, norms and values and mores of that society, whatever society we're born into. Meals are the main way that any society passes its values from generation to generation. Looking deeply into any culture's meals is an adventure of looking deeply into the hidden assumptions about the nature of reality, the relationships between humans with each other, with animals, with the earth, with ecosystems with God, the universe, with everything. So meals are incredibly imp important and powerful in programming us, basically, and how we look at ourselves and how we look at our life and our relationships. And so when we look deeply into our society's food system, it's the greatest adventure of looking deeply into understanding our society, which is important because we have to understand ourselves, we have to understand our society because we're products of our culture in many deep ways. So when we question the official stories of our society about food, we're questioning actually this deep program. And it's a program, it's injected into us. Kind of like, remember in that movie, The Matrix, where Neo at the beginning, he's kind of figuring things out and he's kind of questioning everything. And then um, the government, the state, whatever it is, they figure out we've got a problem here and they capture him and they inject something into him. But then, the good, you know, uh, Morpheus kind of, they take that out. You know? And uh, that's what's happened to all of us. We've been injected with a program growing up in this society that is not in our best interest. It really reduces not only our capacity for health, vitality, and, and, and freedom, but also for intelligence. I mean, for, for really deeply understanding the nature of reality, our capacity for connecting, our capacity for relaxing and having inner peace for awakening our compassion, a sense of justice. All these things are repressed by animal agriculture. So this is the reason. Um, the underlying uh, reality that no one can question, uh, the very conservative estimate, is that just in the United States, every single day, we're killing 75 million animals. This is the ongoing reality. This is something that is just happening. And it's, it's um, relentless, and it's routine. And so there's no big headline in the New York Times saying, wow, 75 million animals were killed yesterday. What, what kind of tragedy happened? It's business as usual. And the good news really in all of this is that this, is, this, this vast killing machine that we have created, that we're actually born into, and we're forced from the time we're little kids to support, because we're forced to not just watch adults eating the flesh and secretions of tortured animals, but they make us eat it too, right? So we have to engage in that behavior. But the, the good news, in a sense, is that this, this whole thing is not happening against our will in the deep sense that it's not some kind of war that the government is sending us to and we can't stop it. 
these 75 million animals are being killed for one reason. We're taking out our wallets and we're saying we're paying for it, right? We're voting for it with our money. And so this is a vote that always gets counted. I don't know about those other votes. Maybe I don't think they have to even get counted anymore, but these votes definitely get counted. And so we're telling the economic uh, and agricultural system to kill more animals, to grow more grain, to feed to these animals, to cut down more trees, kill more fishes, all this stuff. So the good news is that as we as individuals wake up and stop doing that and start voting for plant-based foods that are organic and unprocessed, then we begin to vote for a benevolent, sustainable uh, system that promotes freedom and compassion and justice and kindness and so forth. And the other system will break down and we can actually not only do that, but we can share these ideas with other people. That's why I love the seed experience. You know, it's people who are celebrating the fact that we can thrive and be uh, not only as healthy, but actually a lot healthier uh, on a plant-based diet and, and, and living as vegans. So, so that's the basic reality. Now, what I'd like to do just briefly, because what's probably going to end up happening, you'll hear me um, talking faster and faster and faster because there's so much I want to share. And the World Peace Diet is an audio book. It's 13 and a half hours long, right? And <laughs> I only have an hour. So um, I'm just going to touch on the main points here. So the, the basic idea is that eating animal foods is enormously inefficient. I'll talk just briefly about the environmental devastation because I think it's important to understand this. We live for 17 years in an RV traveling all over North America, solar, power, solar, solar panels on the roof, giving lectures and so forth. And we see very clearly, it becomes very obvious that the, this huge animal killing machine, 75 million every day, is, is, is a machine that reaches its tentacles everywhere. It reaches all over the United States and North America into the forests, into the rivers, into the lakes, uh, into the oceans. And, and into the rainforests of South America. And there's no place on earth, actually, that I don't think that gets away from it. This, it has tentacles that reach everywhere, and everything it touches, it damages. It's toxic, it's polluting, it's violent, it's traumatic, it's just uh, devastating to people, animals, wildlife, and ecosystems on every single level. It, it is. Uh, be, one of the reasons why is that it's so inefficient. It takes huge amounts of grain and soybeans, for example, genetically engineered, typically monocropped fields, gigantic. We just, it just goes on forever and ever in a lot of places. And it's not food for people. It's food for animals. You don't usually see the animals. They're stuck away in these stinking sheds where they never see the light of day, but they're, they need to eat a huge, huge amounts of food. Probably 80 to 90 percent of uh, most of the grains, like alfalfa, 100 percent, and um, uh, soy and corn and, and wheat and other grains and things are fed to animals. And these animals, what do they do? They convert all of this food, which actually could feed people. Uh, I wouldn't eat it if it wasn't genetically engineered, but I mean, the, the, basically we could, you know, we could feed so many people. But these animals convert this stuff to saturated fat, cholesterol, acidifying animal protein, and massive amounts of sewage which is polluting the groundwater and as well as surface water and also huge amounts of methane and nitrous oxide which are now well understood to be the main driving fo force behind global climate destabilization. So you have this massive environmental devastation driven by one thing, people taking out their wallets and paying for meat, dairy products and eggs causing uh, all these, these monocrop fields which are a war against nature, where we don't let anything grow except one species. We use pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and chemical artificial fertilizers in order to do that. The runoff from all of that is going into the water, going into lakes and streams and rivers and into the oceans, ends up in the oceans. It's killing birds and bees and butterflies and fishes and causing dead zones. There's over 450 dead zones now in the oceans caused by animal agriculture. The largest one in the whole world is at the end of the Mississippi River in the Gulf of Mexico, a huge dead zone because of the nutrient-rich runoff, the chemical fertilizers that kill, take all the oxygen out, cause, cause algae blooms and are destroying the, the oceans. And so what animal agriculture does is not only devastating uh, our, our, the land with soil erosion and, and air and water pollution, 
It takes huge amounts of water, fresh water, and this is becoming a very uh, limited resource all over the world because of this. Aquifers are being pumped dry, uh, and it takes, it's 32 to 1, according to the United Nations. These are very conservative estimates. In other words, 30 people eating a vegan plant-based diet use as much water as one person, one person eating a, a standard Western diet. So if we want to reduce the devastating uh, effects of, of, of water pollution and, and water use, to move to a plant-based diet is the best thing we can do if we care about the earth. And also it's about 15 or 20 to 1 in terms of uh, land use, pollution, and, uh, and um, petroleum use, and so forth. So we can, we're talking about huge orders of magnitude uh, of environmental devastation caused by animal agriculture that could be remedied. So the great news is that we live on this beautiful, abundant planet that could easily feed everyone on a fraction of the land. If we ate plant-based foods, we could allow the forests to come back, the rivers to come back, the oceans to come back, and the rainforest to come back because they are being devastated by animal agriculture. Rainforests right now in the Amazon were cutting down, according to the most recent uh, studies done about three months ago, about approximately an acre per second were cutting down to grow soybeans to feed to factory farm pigs, cows, and chickens. And that, that, that meat from that and the soy from that is, uh, is exported all over the world, including to the United States and Europe and China and so forth. So we're cutting down rainforests, which is causing the mass extinction of species. We're losing genetic diversity because rainforests are not just tree farms, right? They have incredibly beautiful, lush ecosystems with, with so many species in them, and they're going there as we cut down the forest, birds and mammals and fishes and plants and so forth. And we're also cutting down, uh, excuse me, we're also overfishing the oceans extremely. Most people don't realize this because we're not just catching fish for people to eat. The animal agriculture industry discovered a long time ago that if you enrich, it's called enriching the feed. If you enrich the feed uh, of pigs and cows and chickens and so forth, they will get uh, fatter and it's economically uh, advisable. So uh, they give more milk and, and, and put on more weight. So they're enriching the feed with fish meal. So the demand for fish is almost infinite. And this is, we see this happening. We see uh, the oceans being overfished uh, just enormously so that just recently uh, one of the top oceanographers in the world was saying how many lar parts of the ocean, the large fish populations are completely gone. They've been driven to, into extinction or into the brink of extinction. Jellyfish are taking over large areas of the ocean, again, because of animal agriculture. People don't realize, for example, that cows in the United States eat more fish than human beings do. You, know, you think, what do you mean cows eating fish? Have you ever seen a cow jumping into a stream trying to catch a fish? <laughs> you know, they're not supposed to be eating fish, but they are because it, it boosts their production. So cows aren't just eating grass like they normally would. They're feeding them grain to make them give more milk. Uh, but they don't just stop there. Um, they feed them, uh, and that causes E. coli and a lot of things, but they feed them meat. So they're feeding them fish meal as well as euthanized dogs and cats, roadkill, uh, chickens and cows, uh, byproducts from the slaughter industry. Animals are being fed to each other. Cows are eating other cows. Cows are eating calves. You know, that was typical um, because it, would, it was a way to enrich the feed, but it causes mad cow disease, so you're not supposed to do that anymore. But the basic idea is we have the system in place which is causing the mass extinction of wildlife. We're losing, we don't know exactly, but uh, biologists are estimating between 50 and 250 species every year, uh, excuse me, every day are going extinct. Driven, again, by one thing, people taking out their wallets and paying for meat, dairy products, and eggs, cutting down rainforests, cutting down and destroying the oceans. And so if we care at all about the earth, there's no greater gift we can give to the world than to move toward a plant-based diet. And I would recommend while you're at it, moving to a plant-based diet that is organic because organically grown uh, food, plant-based foods, uh, really are uh, so much more uh, compassionate and just to the uh, birds and fish and other animals, insects and so forth, because pesticides uh, and, and all this stuff kill animals. And, and so I would say organic plant-based, and also on top of that, I really highly recommend in, uh, as much as possible in, uh, minimally processed foods. It's not a good idea to be eating foods with a lot of chemical preservatives and, 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 um, and, and uh, other stuff like we find in processed food. So as much as possible, fresh foods, whole grains, whole whole foods. And when we do that, we create really the possibility of our planet 
to be healthy and ecosystems to be healthy for the, um, for the, for the planet to heal itself, but for also for ourselves to heal ourselves. So that's, a, in a nutshell, briefly, the environmental devastation of animal agriculture. It's, extreme, it's by far the worst thing we're doing to, you know, on this planet in terms of devastating the climate, the oceans, the rivers, uh, the land, pollution, everything. Animal agriculture is uh, the most devastating activity, also killing off wildlife as well. Um, besides damaging the, the environment, though, I think it's important to understand that animal agriculture affects our culture. We want to live in a healthy environment. We also want to live in a healthy society. But animal agriculture is devastating to our society because it's so unjust. It's so unfair. You know, basically, we're growing enough food on this earth right now to feed between 12 and 15 billion people. Every year, we grow enough food to feed 12 to 15 billion people. We only have seven, right? 7.3 billion, something like that. How is it possible for us to be growing enough food to feed 12 to 15 billion people, and yet we allow and we force, actually, into starvation? According to the estimates, it's at least 1 billion people. Many people say it's closer to 2 billion of our brothers and sisters are starving to death. 30, 40, 50,000 people every day, children mainly, are dying of starvation. How, why are we doing that? Well, basically, as I've been talking about, most of the grain that we're growing Instead of feeding it to people who are hungry, we feed it to animals. And the reason that happens is that those of us in the industrialized nations of the world and the wealthier people on the planet, it is not difficult for us with our more high-powered economic systems to drive up the price of grain on the world markets to feed to our imprisoned pigs, cows, and chickens, and factory farm fishes also eat a lot of grain. And so we feed it to them, and uh, we drive up the price of grain on the world market hot, too high for people in less industrialized nations of the world who have less high-powered economies, many of whom are driven off of the land by large financial institutions, by the IMF austerity programs, by World Bank policies, by um, large corporations, and they're, and they're starving. They see their kids dying in their arms. And so when you have that kind of inequity, that kind of injustice, where some people see their babies going hungry and starving, while not far away, there are other people that are eating so high off the hog, literally, that they're taking most of the land, most of the grain, most of the petroleum and water, while these people don't have anything, and, and feeding it to cows and pigs and eating the flesh of these poor animals. And that kind of injustice makes it very difficult to ever have peace. We can't have peace without justice. So anyone who's eating meat, dairy products, and eggs, it's directly causing this system that is basically causing the death and starvation of, of, of millions of people every year, and it's unnecessary. And the irony is that while these people are dying of hunger and malnutrition and diarrhea, you know, things that come from hunger, the people in the, in the eating these rich diets in the West have epidemics of diseases that come from eating all this saturated fat and cholesterol and acidifying animal protein, diseases like diabetes, obesity, and uh, liver disease and kidney disease and arthritis and breast and prostate and colon cancer and strokes and heart disease and uh, dementia and uh, autoimmune diseases. Now, all of these are linked definitively to diets that are high in animal-based foods. So when we begin to wake up, we begin to see that if we want to have a healthy society with a healthy economy where we're not spending all our money on a healthcare system that's just sucking the money and the vitality out of our economy, putting it mostly in the hands of a tiny wealthy elite, causing hunger and war and, and the huge war machine that profits off of all of this. And then the other thing we have to realize is that animal agriculture at its core is all about one thing. It's about inflicting trauma. It's traumatic. When people are electroshocking animals, mutilating them, raping them on rape racks, stealing their babies, hanging them upside down by one leg, stabbing them in the neck, you know, they're struggling, they are traumatized, they are experiencing either chronic or acute fear and chronic or acute pain. That's what animal agriculture does. And people, so the animals are traumatized, the food is a product of trauma, we're eating it, we're giving it to our children, and then the people have to do the work. We have whole armies of our brothers and sisters that have to work in slaughterhouses and factory farms and stockyards and all these places, electroshocking and stabbing animals. They're traumatized. They're inflicting trauma. And so uh, they're, you know, they're doing the terrible stuff that we wouldn't want to have to do. And this is work that brings out the worst in them. 
Unfortunately, they have the highest rates of suicide and drug addiction and alcoholism and spousal abuse and child abuse, and they very often, unfortunately, go back into their neighborhoods and communities and do terrible things to other people because they get so damaged. They have what psychologists refer to as perpetrator-induced traumatic stress disorder. So it's like Martin Luther King said, it's like Mahatma Gandhi said, and these basic wisdom teachings, if, you know, this, this basic teaching that violence anywhere hurts everyone everywhere because we're all interconnected. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere because we're all interconnected. And what veganism is about, essentially, is the same thing. It says kindness and compassion and caring anywhere blesses everyone everywhere because we're all interconnected. And each one of us makes a huge difference. When we go out and we leave this seed experience and we live our lives, when we take out our wallets and pay for something, it has huge ramifications. And if we're paying for meat, dairy products, and eggs, we're paying people to do, t to do terribly violent things that brings out the worst in them, causing webs of trauma to go out into our whole society, which causes war, uh, fear, and violence, and, and mental illness, and all these things, and as well as hunger and starvation, as well as terror and fear for, for wild animals. We have the Department of Wildlife Services of the Department of Agriculture that spends millions of dollars killing millions of of coyotes and prairie dogs and otters and foxes and uh, bears and, and um, raccoons and beavers. I mean, they kill everything because ranchers don't want any animals out there. So this whole war against nature is completely unnecessary. And so culturally and environmentally, it's devastating. And then to our own health, just briefly, you know, in the World Peace Diet, I have a chapter that goes into uh, basically our, our physiology. What are we designed to eat? And we look carefully at our physiology, and we see it's really beautiful. You know, if you look at our teeth, our dentition, we have basically very small teeth that are designed for either cutting off or grinding grains and vegetable-type uh, 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 succulent matter. We have uh, very soft teeth that cannot, it would just break off if you were trying to bite through hide or bones or things like that. We have... Um, uh, basically, tylen is the, en the basic enzyme in our saliva that only does one thing. It, is, it, it um, digests and breaks down complex carbohydrates. Uh, we have a, a very a weak hydrochloric acid in our stomach that is not very good at breaking down meat. We have very long digestive tract, of course, which is devastated by meat and really devastated by dairy. We don't have any renin, which is the enzyme that calves have to to uh, break down casein, the main protein in dairy, which so dairy causes incredible devastation. Uh, autoimmune disease, type 1, type 2 diabetes, uh, the, all the sore throats, runny noses, colds, colics, and things that kids have, you know, acne. It's all basically very clearly linked with dairy products. We have circulatory system that does not tolerate saturated fat and cholesterol as well. So the basic truth, when we look deeply into this, is that all of us have been given the gift by the benevolent creator of a physical vehicle that we can use to live our lives, our physical body, that can thrive and, uh, and doesn't need any animal to suffer to give us all the nutrients that we need, but we're all born into a society where we're forced from the time we're little infants to participate in mealtime rituals where we're taught to take that gift we've been given from the benevolent creator, and instead of being grateful for that, we throw it right back into her face or his face, and we say, we're going to stab and kill animals anyway. We're going to cut down rainforests anyway. We're going to destroy anyway. And so when we do that, we don't realize it, but we not only devastate the outer world and the outer culture that we're living in, animal agriculture is the most devastating thing we're doing to nature and the environment and our culture, but the thing that we really have to understand is that we also are devastating the inner landscape of our spiritual and psychological clarity and awareness. And so I'd like to talk about that just briefly here. Um, and the World Peace Diet is kind of well known for going into the deep structure of our society and of our, uh, of our own um, inner being to understand this at a deeper level. And so the basic idea is that the only reason any of us are eating meat, dairy products, and eggs it's because of the communities that we're born into. You know, we do it because we're products of our culture. There's a great saying. I love this saying by uh, Krishnamurti. Krishnamurti said, it is not a good idea to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. It's not a good idea to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. 
we want, as human beings, we tend to want to be well adjusted to whatever society we're born into, right? We want to get along with everybody. We want everybody to like us. We want to be part of the group. And meals are the most powerful way that we bond with each other. So if we go to the, the church barbecue or we go to the company picnic or whatever it is and we're there and we're, you know, the pressure is to eat what everybody's eating. You know, we want the boss to like us. We go over to the boss. The boss is, you know, chewing on a chicken leg or something. And, and we go, we, we say, oh, I better eat one too. And, oh, you like chicken like I do. Yeah, you're a good worker. You'll go far in our company, you know. If you go and say, I'm a vegan, he goes, what the heck are you, a vegan? Get out of here. You know, I don't want to. <laughs> you know, so, you know, we want to kind of fit in and go along. But the thing is, when we're eating animal foods, um, we're acting in a way that is so devastating to the earth and to ourselves and to everything that something within us, our natural wisdom, our natural sense of justice, compassion, awareness, begins to rise up and we begin to question what everybody's doing and what we've been doing. And that is the greatest gift we can give, really, to ourselves and to our society. Uh, but to understand this, we have to realize that we're born into a society, like I said, killing 75 million animals every day for food, so the co everyone in the community is basically enrolled in the mentality to do that, right? We're enrolled growing up here through the meal rituals to eat meat, dairy products, and eggs because every meal we're taught to do that. So we are all forced to adopt a mentality that is in attitudes that are not in our best interest. I would say there's maybe five or so primary characteristics of this inner mentality. The most obvious one really is it's a mentality of reductionism, of learning to look with eyes that when we see a being, we reduce that being to a thing, to a commodity that we buy and sell on the market, that we sell by the pound. Can you imagine being, your value is, is like how much, you, how much you weigh, how much the meat, how much your flesh weighs, that's your value? I mean, how incredibly insane that is. And so what we're, what we're seeing is, you know, how many of you... For example, um, at some point in your life have had some kind of a companion animal, like a dog or a cat or something. Yeah, quite a few. Yeah, most, yeah a lot of us. So we, we're aware when we have these companion animals that they are beings, right, with personalities, with, um, uh, with an individual uh, sense of their own uh, uh, having interests, right? They, they don't like it if you step on their tail. They go, no, no, get off my tail, you know? They don't like to be harmed. They don't want to be locked in the closet. They don't want to be starved. They don't want to have their babies stolen from them. And, you know, they, they yearn to, to fulfill their desires. They're capable of feeling pain and suffering. All, all animals, I mean, pigs and cows and chickens are no different from our dogs and cats and so forth. So these animals, what we, are, we do, though, we are raised in a society where we're taught from the time we're little kids, we're ritually taught. This is the most powerful way to teach somebody something. It's ritualized. So we engage in this ritualistic behavior where we actually eat it. Think of that. We're eating it. It becomes the cells of our body of disconnectedness, of commodification of living beings, learning to see beings merely as things, as products to be used. We begin to we create economic systems where human beings, where we do it to each other. One of the things I realized is in, in all my research for the World Peace Diet, is whatever we've done to animals or we do to animals, sooner or later, we do it to each other. You know, and we reduce, we see other be people, we see people as means to an end, as a, somebody to be used as an instrument to get what I want. And, we, and then we do it to ourselves. You know, we have to sell it, we have to, you know, turn ourselves into an object and, and sell ourselves on the market, try to make a good resume so that I'm a, I'm a thing, you know. And this is all profoundly... Uh, devastating to our actual deep sense of self-worth and self-confidence because as we sow, so shall we reap. If we're going to steal the purposes of animals, if we're going to steal their freedom, if we're going to steal their uh, whole uh, possibility to live their lives uh, with a sense of self-confidence and self-respect, we're going to lose that ourselves. And so what veganism is essentially, it's about taking back my purpose in life, my self-respect, uh, my sense of self-confidence and, 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 and doing it in a way that I'm doing it because I'm respecting others. We will never have self-respect if we don't respect others. We'll never value our life if we don't value the lives of other living beings. So basically we're injected through the meals with this very toxic uh, mentality of reductionism, of commodification, of disconnectedness. The subtext of every meal is don't make the connection. Don't make the connection between what's on your plate and what it took to get it on your plate. 
You know, it would be very unusual for someone in, in, uh, in the morning having ham, uh, maybe, uh, or sausages in the morning, or bacon or something, and saying, hmm, I wonder, I wonder what she was like. Yeah. What do you mean what she was like? You know, the, I'm, we're eating ham, I mean, the pig, what, what she was like, I wonder what she was like. This is something we just never do, because we are taught in the most powerful way, never go there, stay shallow. Don't look deeply. Don't, don't see what you're actually doing. Stay numb. Stay desensitized. Stay shallow. Stay disconnected. But intelligence is the ability to look deeply, to make connections. So when you have a whole society of people who are, who are ritually taught to stay shallow and don't make connections, then you have a whole society of people who will reliably do whatever the officials tell them to do, who will reliably believe Whatever the officials tell them is reality. And you have people who will go to war and kill people, who will buy stuff, who will get, willingly get drugged and vaccinated and everything else without asking questions. What veganism is about, essentially, is thinking for yourself, trusting your own intuition and wisdom, and looking deeply and, and making an effort to understand beyond just the outer uh, authoritarian voices that, are, that we internalize. To question those, you know. So it's about, so it's it, so veganism is is a sense of kindness, of compassion, of inclusion. Because every meal essentially is disconnectedness, exclusion, teaching us to exclude other beings from the sphere of our compassion and kindness. Um, and it's also a mentality that's injected into us of, pr of privilege and elitism as well. It's very important to understand this, I think, because basically every meal, we're, the subtext of every meal is that there, certain beings are inherently superior. And other beings are inherently inferior. And it's totally fine for the inherently superior beings to dominate and exploit and use and harm and kill, even, inherently inferior beings. And for what reason? Oh, because it tastes good. You know, or because I want to. I have the power. It's might makes right. It's entitlement. And we have a society where that is destroying the health of our relationships. We have a wealthy elite, the 1%, basically are able to control all the institutions in our society, the media, the government, corporations, financial institutions, how we're thinking. And, and so many people don't even have enough money to, to get enough food to eat and have and decent shelter. That kind of inequity is devastating to our happiness on this planet. And yet every single meal is injecting into the population here that this is fine, this is right, the inherently superior dominate the inherently inferior. That's how we live. That's what we do. You've got to question that. Don't believe it. Don't live. Don't foster. Don't take out our wallets and pay for a system that fosters privilege, elitism, entitlement, disconnectedness, numbing, desensitization, and uh, and all and, and commodification of life, reducing beings to things. And then the other thing we have to realize also is that animal agriculture from the very beginning was about one thing. It was about men dominating animals, and not just dominating animals, dominating female animals. From the very beginning, it's about men dominating the reproductive organs of female animals and exploiting them themselves and using them themselves however they want. It's about men learning to see women as mere breeders for their sons and daughters and for their pleasure. It's about dominating and exploiting the sacred feminine that's what animal agriculture is. And so with the arising of, of animal agriculture, we had the arising of a patriarchal society based on the domination not only of animals and nature, but of, of, of women and of, and of the capacity of women to uh, give birth to babies. And this, is, this devastation of the sacred feminine in our, in our society, of, in both men and women. See, in the world piece that I talk about this as Sophia. Sophia is the ancient Greek goddess of wisdom. Right? The word philosophy means the love of Sophia, the love of wisdom. And so we have a, a system in, in place, basically, where we are taught to dominate this, the, the sacred feminine. This, this feminine aspect, uh, Sophia, is, is a force that lives within us. Whether, you know, in women, it's very obvious. It's that, that wisdom within, within women. When we give birth to a baby, that, to love and nurture and nurse and protect and care for that baby and protect the environment and the community, that basic wisdom... Uh, of compassion and kindness for, the, for those who are vulnerable and weak. And, we ha and men have it also. We have a natural sense of caring and protection. 
But when we're forced as little children to participate in mealtime rituals where we're eating the flesh of animals that are mutilated and terribly treated, and we don't know what it is, but, we, but when we find out, we just, it just represses Sophia uh, enormously in all of us. And so the spiritual impulse in us in many ways, and I think also the, the impulse in us to create a more just and harmonious uh, world, a more sustainable and free and equal world, is Sophia. It's that Sophia wisdom. And yet, again, when Sophia is repressed in a society, then it's easy for corporations and large financial institutions to be cutting down rainforests, destroying oceans, and, and causing starvation of, of other human beings. And with, with Sophia's down, we, just, we, don't, we let it happen. We just say, okay, we just don't think about it. You know, we're too busy. We don't care about that. And, and, and it allows corporations uh, to just come invading into our lives with uh, these very... Um, uh, hideous programs, really, to turn children into consumers of their products using manipulative advertising, pornography, and violence, and other things. We wouldn't allow that. Sophia would never allow that. Sophia wants to protect life and defend life. So I think in many ways what veganism is, it's really the resurrection within our hearts and minds and within our society of our inherent wisdom and compassion rising up and protecting the sacred feminine, protecting children and eco ecosystems and communities and our health and our sanity. And so that's why I think there's no greater, more benevolent action anyone can take than to make an effort to understand this because we live in critical times. The power of our technology to destroy nature and each other and animals has made it imperative that we begin to question this behavior. So I have a few more minutes. Um, I want to emphasize just a couple other main points. You know, one of the things that people, when they hear these ideas, uh, people say, well, okay, wait a minute. I mean, this, this may be true, but we've been doing this for a long time, and it must be okay because it's, you know, it's part of who we are. We, we eat meat. You know, we eat dairy. You know, this is, we've been doing it you know, quite a while. It must be part of who we are. So I think it's very, in, in the World Peace Diet, there's a whole chapter that goes into the, the history of this kind of in the beginning so we understand it. I'll just say very briefly because it's important to understand that basically around 10,000 years ago, according to anthropologists, can, we started for the very first time owning animals as property for food. It's called herding or ranching, something like, you know, it's, it's animal agriculture. And so we started that in Iraq, apparently, with wild sheep and wild goats. Originally, people started own, saying, these are my property. This, this whole herd is my property and owning them. And it, it was a very slow revolution. It took thousands of years, it took many, many generations, but gradually, uh, and this was the last revolution our society ever had. There haven't been any revolutions since that. You know, the Industrial Revolution, the Scientific Revolution, they're not revolutions. You can kill more animals and eat more animals than ever. You know, <laughs> it didn't change anything. You know, but, but this really changed things because it was basically a, re a revolution of reductionism, of reducing animals who were always seen as powerful and mysterious and respected uh, cohabitants of the earth with us. But when they were reduced to being mere property, when they became slaves, and we had, to, we had to impregnate them and kill them, we, they began to be despised. And so animals were reduced. Wild animals were also reduced because now they could, get, they could interfere with my property. So they began to be despised and see as pests, and we got to kill them. And then we had the arising for the very first time on this planet of a wealthy elite class. And who was this wealthy elite class? They were the herd, the ones who owned the most capital, livestock. Capital is the ancient um, Latin word. Uh, it means head, as in head of sheep and goats and cows. So whoever owned a lot of capital was the, the proto-capitalists. They owned the wealth. This was wealth. Where, where whoever owned the most sheep was the wealthiest. And they began to dominate all the institutions in these ancient societies and they introduced some institutions or some practices that we still have with us today, which are devastating. Also, it's part of animal agriculture. They invented war, right? I mean, they would see another guy, another capitalist that had a lot of sheep and goats, and they would think, hmm, how can I, I can get as a, the first get-rich-quick scheme, you know? They see this guy's got all these sheep and goats, they think, well, I'm going to go take them. And so, of course, the other guy didn't give up without a fight. So you had the first wars, the first time ever on this planet where you had these large armies battling each other, and it was, they were deadly. I do not recommend reading about these first wars. They were horrific. 
You did not want to lose a war back then. The very first word for war, actually, on this planet is the ancient Sanskrit word gavya. It means the desire for more cows. So they would go and fight. Whoever lost the war, the animals would become their property. The people would become their property. So they invented slavery. We had the first slavery. The women would be impregnated against their will to make more slaves. The men would be castrated against their will like they did the male animals to make them docile. And so we had this whole arising of a society, of a culture that was violent and warlike. Uh, it was where men uh, bought, you know, by, by the time the historic period emerged, right, 3,000 years ago, we have the first writings, the very ancient writings, the Epic of Il Gilgamesh and ancient Sum Sumerian writings, um, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the ancient Greek writings, the ancient Greek mystery plays, the ancient um, Old Testament writings and so forth. We can see it very clearly that by that time, there's a, a wealthy elite class, the kings, they're eating a lot of meat and dairy, and they're always going to war, and women are bought and sold just like chattel property, and boys are, are being taught to emulate the role model of a hard, tough, disconnected macho male who's capable of violence and cruelty and abuse to women, to other men, to animals. And this warlike society spread throughout the Eastern Mediterranean, into the Northern Mediterranean, into Central Asia, into Europe, came over to North America, South America, spread into Africa, spread into Asia. I mean, it's been spreading. It's still spreading, really, in many ways, through the IMF and the World Bank and the large financial institutions and through the large corporations, the agricultural industry, the uh, medical industry, ConAgra, Cargill, Burger King, Monsanto, Kentucky Fried Chicken, these corporations. I call this whole thing the military, industrial, meat, medical, pharmaceutical, media complex, right? It's this vast complex, and it works very well to extract the wealth out of, from everybody and put it in the hands of a tiny elite at the top of the pyramid who then use that to continue to control and manipulate everybody and, and continue war is very profitable, disease is very profitable, environmental destruction, unfortunately, is also very profitable. So we, the people, have to wake up and realize this is what's going on. This is the history of why it's been going on. It's obsolete. We don't have to do it anymore. We, and the reason the system gets its tentacles into us is because we're participating. We're taking out our wallets and paying for meat, dairy products, and eggs. If we're doing that, we're not only causing slavery, we are slaves ourselves. We don't realize it, but we have been injected with a program that takes away our freedom, takes away our health, takes away our, really our capacity to understand what's going on. So this is some of the basic ideas. The other couple, maybe one or two other points I'll make is that, you know, animal foods concentrate physical toxins. They also concentrate metaphysical toxins. In other words, we're not just eating foods that concentrate PCBs and dioxins and heavy metals and nuclear radiation, which is in the fishes that the cows are eating and it's in the, in the grains they're eating and it concentrates in their flesh, especially in their, in their mammary secretions and so forth. There's a lot of physical toxins which are hard for our body to deal with, but there's also metaphysical toxins. I have a whole chapter that goes into the metaphysics of food. We're eating terror and fear and depression and anxiety. Do we want to be feeding that to our children? And the irony is that whatever we do to animals, we end up actually doing to ourselves, and we find that happening. Like we force animals into obesity. We have scientists who have been working for decades to using lighting schedules and feeding and breeding and all these things for, for one reason to try to fatten up animals as quickly as possible. So we sow the seeds of obesity in billions of animals, and what do we find? We have. We have an obesity epidemic. As we sow, so shall we reap. We force these an animals into cancer, we, and we get that. We force them into polluted environments. We force them into stress. We force them into, essentially, uh, situations where they're driven crazy. Really, they're just poor animals are banging their heads against the bars, driven into insanity. And we find the pharmaceutical industry is getting wealthy with three types of drugs they have. One is drugs they give to animals. There's, more, there's over 10,000 different drugs and hormones, antibiotics, that are given to animals who are imprisoned. So the pharmaceutical industry is making you know, billions of dollars there. Then people eat the flesh and secretions of these poor imprisoned drugged animals, and they get the diseases that come from that, right? So then the pharmaceutical industry makes huge profits on, on drugs for diabetes. For, uh, for, for arteries and for heart disease and for strokes and for all these things. So they make a lot of profits there. And then the biggest one is, their biggest profits are, are for drugs for mental illness. They make more profits for drugs for chronic 
uh, uh, stress and pain and anxiety and frustration and insomnia. And, and people who are taking all these drugs are people typically who are eating the flesh and secretions of animals who are suffering from chronic pain and, and frustration and anxiety and stress and insomnia. So as we sow, we reap. And so the idea is we can, we can understand this and stop participating in that. And when we do that, we begin to, to, to make uh, the most positive changes we can, not only for ourselves, but for the whole world. This, this is the most benevolent thing we can do to animals and future generations and ecosystems and hungry people and slaughterhouse workers and so forth. So to, to really make an effort to understand the deep structure of our society, I think is the greatest gift we can give. And um, so I'll just close my talk, and then we'll have time for maybe for uh, a couple of questions also. Um, and with the basic idea of maybe two things. Number one, this message I'm, I'm making an effort to uh, bring to you and to the world, essentially, is hopefully you understand it's a very positive message in the sense that we as individuals have enormous power. We can make an effort to understand these things. We can bring our lives into alignment with this understanding. We can live our lives this way. We can take out our wallets and pay for uh, food and other products that do not cause abuse to, to non-human animals and to, uh, and to other human beings. And as we do that, we can transform our, not only our own lives, but we can share this with other people. So like we have an online program, the World Peace Diet Facilitator Training, which I've actually met a few people already here this morning who said they've gone through that or they are going through it. But the whole idea is really to learn how to thrive as vegans, and it's wonderful to do, and to learn also how to be an effective vegan advocate. And so the, the message here is that we can do both of these things. And it's a wonderful way to live. So I think all of us can contribute to the most important benevolent revolution that we absolutely must uh, engage in. We, we're called, I think, today on this planet, if we're here alive and aware, to question the official food stories and to find the unique contribution that we can make to help, our, to help each other, to help people understand this. Because the only reason anyone's eating meat and dairy is because of the communities we're in. So, for example, right now, we have the seed experience. This is a two-day community of sanity where we're sharing these ideas. We're sharing practical ideas. We're sharing philosophical ideas to help empower people. Myself, you know, I remember when I look back at my life, I was born and raised back in the 1950s in New England. When I was seven years old, I said to my mother, Mom, the kind of food we're eating, is this what everybody eats? My mother said, yeah, everybody eats this. This is what everybody eats. And then she came back a few minutes later and she said, well, actually there are vegetarians. And she said it in this way that they live on another planet. In fact, she said, I've never met one. And she said, you'll never meet one either. <laughs> They're hypothetical people. You know, they don't really exist. Where do they get their protein, for gosh sake? You know? So my mother was totally right. I never heard the word again. I went away to the summer camp in these beautiful green mountains of Vermont where I was taught to kill my own chickens. We were taught to kill our own cows, the dairy cow, when they won't give enough milk. We put a gun to her head and we pulled the trigger. We killed her. That's what dairies do, these beautiful little quaint dairies. They're incredibly, horrifically violent toward animals. And so I did all that and I thought it was right. I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt when I was 13 years old that animals are put here by God for us to eat. They taste good, they don't have a soul. And if you don't eat them, you'll definitely die within 24 hours of a protein deficiency. So. Uh, so that's basically what I was taught, and, and I never questioned it. But luckily, I went away, actually, I went away to college. I heard there were some vegetarians there. This was in Maine in 1975. I never met one. Like my mother said, you'll never meet one. Uh, but then when I left home and I tried to get to California, I ended up walking eventually to Tennessee on this kind of a spiritual pilgrimage. And I found the farm in Tennessee, which was the largest hippie commune in the world at that time, 900 people, mostly from California. And they were living what we would call a, uh, a vegan lifestyle. They called themselves vegetarians because no one heard of it back then. But no meat, no dairy, no eggs, no wool, you know, all that. And they were doing it um, because of p world peace and because of the cruelty towards animals. I talked to them about it. And so I remember that day when, I, when this fellow told me about the cruelty to animals and the starvation that eating animal agriculture causes. And I had this wonderful example of 900 people that were all thriving on a plant-based diet. They had probably 200 kids, vegan from birth. They were doing great. So that was it. I never ate meat again in my life since that day in 1975 when I heard about that. And then um, I found out uh, when I met Madeline, my wife uh, in Switzerland years later, that she basically went 
V uh, stopped eating meat at the same time also, at the same time. So time to wrap up? Yeah. Okay, so, the, so basically the idea I'm going to close with is that community, the power of community. Community is the reason we eat animal foods. We can create communities of sanity that can help countless people to transform our society and make an effort to understand that. Much love to you all. Thank you for making this effort. I really appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. William Tuttle. If you guys want to go over there to um, answer, ask, ask your questions to him at his book signing, you'll be over there taking the questions. And also, we're